Well, welcome back to our series called Faith, How to Build a Faith That Works Whenever Life Doesn't. We're going to dive right into today. Uh, here's where we are as a world. I want to kind of just give us a state of the union. Here's where we are as a world, not just in America, but globally, all around the world. People are facing a viral disease called COVID-19 um, that's really set a lot of people at a Disease. It's caused a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of um, instability in our souls due to COVID-19. People are also facing social instability due to all the violence and unrest that we're seeing in our cities. People are also facing a lot of financial insecurity right now due to millions of people worldwide that have actually lost their jobs. And then we're also seeing a lot of political incivility because of the arguments going on across the aisle and hatredness and bitterness are at an all-time high. Friends, we're going through some really tough times right now in our world, in our communities, in our society, in our culture. And I've been in many conversations where the question has come up, do you think we're living in the last days. And the question also comes up, how do you stay positive? Pastor, how do you stay positive about things when there's so much negative in the world? The reason, the reason that we can stay positive as Christians is because of this. We know the end of the story. And guess what? I got some good news for you. We win. We win we win. If you've ever watched a movie and you know the end of the story, uh, the tense sections in that movie aren't quite as intense because you know the end of the story. That's why today we're going to look at this in our faith series. We're going to look at a faith that knows the end of the story. Through this series, we've been really working our way through the book of James and through the book of James. I need to point out this when it comes to our topic today, that four different times James reminds us that Jesus is coming back to this earth one day. We don't know when it's going to happen. No one does. And by the way, if anyone ever claims to know the last day on this earth, whenever the world's just going to you know, end and Jesus is going to come back, they are a liar. You can look them in their eyes and go, you're lying. Because nobody knows when Jesus is coming back. But we do know this, he is coming. And we're going to talk about this today. Did you know that there's more? Check this cool fact out. Did you know that there's more in the Bible about Jesus' second coming to this earth in the future than there is about his first coming to the earth 2,000 years ago at Christmas time? Did you know that? That means this. This is a subject that you need to know about. And as your pastor, I feel the responsibility to equip you and make sure that you are ready for Jesus' second coming. See, a lot of Christians, they, they know that Jesus is coming back someday. Hey, is Jesus going to come back one day? Yeah, he's going to come back one day. But we kind of have a nonchalant attitude about it. We, we don't prepare for it. We don't think about it too much because we think that, oh, that's far out into the future. But today you might have a, a second thought about that as we read Scripture and we look directly at the Bible. So let's do this. Let's take a look at the Bible and check out James's four reminders, four reminders that he gives us about the Lord's coming. James 5, 7, it says this, be patient. Then, brothers, until what? Until the Lord's coming. Again, he's coming again. James 5, 8. Hey, don't give up hope. No matter where you are, don't give up hope because the Lord is coming soon. In the grand scheme of things, in trillions and trillions and trillions of years of eternity, this earth is, and the time on it is simply just a speck. It's happening very soon. It's happening. Jesus coming back is happening very soon compared to the trillions of years of eternity. James 2, 12, it says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged. 
And hold on to that scripture because we're going to get to that in just a second. Speak and act. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged. James 5, 9. The judge is near, ready to appear. The judge is near, ready to appear. How many of you know the Bible rhymes sometimes? I mean, the Bible's got lyrics too, you know what I'm saying? The first time Jesus came, check this out, he came to save the world. The next time that Jesus comes, guess what he's coming to do? Jesus is coming to judge the world and reward those who stayed faithful to him. How's your faithfulness to Jesus going? How's your following Jesus going? Are you ready? If Jesus came back today, right now in this moment, are you ready to face judgment? Are you ready to face eternity? Today, I'm not, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer two questions. The first one is this, is what will the last days look like? That's an important question to answer. Number two, how should I prepare, prepare for the second coming? Here's what Jesus would say. And, and so let's take a look at this first question. What will the last days be like? Here's what Jesus would say, or what Jesus did say in Matthew 24, 21. It says, there will be great distress. Great message, Pastor. All right, peace out. I love you guys. I'm out. I mean, we could stop right there, given where our world is at right now. There will be great distress. Globally, all around the world, there will be great distress in the world at that time. Unparalleled since the world began. Here's Timothy's description of the last days. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. The last days will be very difficult times to follow Jesus. People will be self-absorbed, thinking only of themselves and money. They'll use their time in prideful self-promotion. <laughs> kind of sounds like social media a little bit. You gotta, gotta build your brand. I, gotta, I wanna be an influencer. I'm gonna self-promote myself and enjoy demeaning and insulting each other. Boy, there can be, really be some, some insulting going on online, can't there be? They'll be ungrateful and ignore their parents. Nothing will be considered sacred or holy as they make fun of everything. Even in some Christian circles, there's, there's Christians that I know, that probably you know, that they make fun and laugh at their sin. It's very biblical. We're going to make fun of everything. They'll be unloving. Did you know that it's important to be serious about your faith. Yeah, be fun, be jovial, have, have a good time, be kind. But it's very important that you take your faith in Jesus Christ and as a follower of Jesus, seriously. Putting Him number one in our lives because that's where He belongs. We need to be serious. We need to wake up and we need to take our faith in a serious way because our eternity depends on it. And if we actually achieve our purpose, other people's eternity depends on us taking our belief seriously. They'll be unloving and unforgiving and will slander and gossip about others. People will lack self-control of their impulses. Many will be cruel and violent. Cruel and violent. And they will hate everything that is good. Seen the news lately? Mainstream media? They will hate everything that is good. People will do reckless things in foolishness and pride. Be puffed up with ego. Be addicted to lust. And love pleasure more than God. They will claim to be spiritual but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Hey, you believe in Jesus Christ? Oh, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. Like, I want the get out of hell free car. You know what I mean? Like, I, oh, yeah, I believe. I'm not going to say I don't believe because I better believe in Jesus because I want to go to heaven. But you deny his power that can change your life here on this earth. Did you know that God doesn't want you to just miss hell but live like hell on earth? When we apply Jesus' ways into our lives, guess what? Life begins to work. 
You cannot convince me otherwise because I lived my life without God and I have lived my life for, for God and God's ways work. His blessings come. His favor comes. His goodness comes. Yes, there's challenging times. Yes, there's difficult times. But man, the presence of God surpasses all of those. And the cool thing is, is we don't have to walk through life alone because Jesus is with us. He's with us. We've got to receive his power. Here's another thing Peter says, 2 Peter 3.3, 3, it says this, in the last days, there will be mockers who laugh at the truth and ridicule you because they are controlled by their feelings and evil lust. They just want to do every evil thing that they desire. Sound familiar? Sound familiar to you? Then Peter explains what's actually going to happen when Jesus shows up in the future at his second coming to judge the world. Here's what it says. 2 Peter 3, 10 through, 3, 10 through 13, it says, The day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. Like a thief in the night. It's going to come unexpectedly. There's going to be people that are driving. There's going to be people that are sleeping. There's going to be things that are happening. And whoop, they get called up to heaven. It is going to be up utterly chaos in this world utterly chaos in this world but for those who know jesus christ it's going to be the most peaceful most incredible time that they have ever experienced because then they are going to be in the midst of the savior since there will since everything we see will one day come to an end what kind of people should we be what kind of people should we be we should live, check this out, we should live holy and godly lives. Looking forward to the coming day of God and it's the speed it's coming. We look forward to a new heaven and a new earth that Jesus had promised. You see this, this earth that we live in, it's broken. One day it will be gone and there will be a new heaven. There will be a new earth that is perfect. And it will be a world where goodness lives. So looking at these passages, let me ask you this question. Are we living in the last days? <laughs> nobody, nobody can know for sure if we're living in the last days, but it's probably safe to say that we're living in the later days, maybe. That's why I want to answer this second question. How should we live to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Here are three things you need to do to be prepared for whenever Jesus comes back. The first thing you need to do, number one, is this. Clean out the garbage in your life. Get the garbage out. Take the garbage out of your life. When you have a guest coming over, what do you do? You, you clean up. You tidy up. You, you prepare. You put things in order. Why? Because you want to prepare the best place that you possibly can for your guest. Jesus is coming. And you want to prepare your life for that event. James 1, 20 through 21, it says this, getting angry at things will never help you live the righteous life God wants. So what? So get rid of all the filth and evil habits you've learned. Then humbly accept God's word planted in your heart because it can save your soul. It can save your soul. James says this, get the garbage out of your life. What garbage do you need to get out of your life? What garbage do you keep sweeping under the rug? What garbage are you being deceived by? Look, I'm not just talking about sin. Yes, get sin out of your life. But some of you are so wounded, you, you become so bitter, you become so angry because people have hurt you. Guess what? Welcome to the crowd. People are going to hurt you, but you've got to let go of that wound. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. You've got to pray for those people. Get rid of the wounds. Push the wounds out. Let God heal them. Let kindness fill you where anger was. Let love fill you where hurt was. Forgive people. Get rid of the garbage in your life. 
And yes, get rid of the sinful habits in your life as well and put God number one. Again, that's the only way that your life is going to work correctly. James says this. He says, man, get the garbage out of your life. See, one, one lie, if you're anything like me, one lie that's easy to listen to at times is this. Oh, it's just a little bit of garbage in my life. It, it's really not that big of a deal. Think about this for a second. Imagine if I said, hey, I'm coming over and, and uh, I'm going to bring some brownies and, and man, these brownies are going to be so good. And I got to your house and, and I start sharing with you how I made these brownies. And I said, hey, man, I, I got the brownie mix and man, I got it all stirred up and ready to go. And man, I was like licking that, you know, spatula because that brownie batter was so good and incredible. I can't wait till you taste these brownies. And then, hey, but I want to give you a heads up. One thing I did right before I put the batter in to the oven is I went outside in the backyard and I have a couple dogs and, and I grabbed a just a little bit. No, no. Hey, just a little bit. I grabbed a little bit of poo, a little bit of dog poo, and I just kind of sprinkled it in the brownies. And I, then I baked them bad boys. And man, hey, you want some brownies? I can't wait for you to taste these things. They're incredible. How many of you be like, ah, uh, no, nah, not nah, pastor. I think I'm going to pass on those brownies. Same way with sin. A little bit affects the whole thing. And James says, get the garbage out of your life. Clean your life up. Clean out the garbage in your life. The second thing you need to do is this. Number two, stay close to Christ. Stay close to Christ. Here's what James says. Here's one cool thing. Check this out. The spirit that God gave to live in us wants us for himself alone. So give yourself completely to God. Draw close to God and he will draw close to you. I was just driving in my car the other day and I said, God, I just want to be close to you. God, I worship you. God, I praise you. I draw close to you. And in that moment, you know what I felt in my spirit and in my heart? Just the fullness of God. Just the fullness of God in my life. The Bible says that when we draw close to God, he will draw close to us regardless of of if we're moving towards the climax of history and Jesus is second coming or not, regardless of if Jesus is coming back tomorrow or in the distant future, that's good advice for any crisis or chaos that you go through. Draw close to God. Here's the deal. If, if you don't feel close to God, I have some news for you. God's not the one that moved. We move. You move. Draw near to God. Stay close to God. Christ. First John 2, 28, it says, continue to live in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. James says, if you want to be prepared, stay connected to Jesus Christ. Here's what's going to happen one day on the day that Jesus comes back. On the day that Jesus comes back, there's going to be an instant transformation in your life. First John 3, 2 through 3, it says this, yes, dear friends, we are already God's children. Sure. But we can't even imagine what it will be like whenever Christ returns. But we know that when he comes back, we will become like him. There's that transformation. We will become like him, for we will see him as he really is. This hope causes us, check this out, this hope causes us to what? Keep ourselves pure, just as Christ is pure. See, a lot of times we think, when we think of pure, we think of sexual sin, like, you know, keeping ourselves free from sexual sin. Yes, that's very important. But this word pure in the Greek that, that James write, it literally means remain, to keep unpolluted. And so here's what I want to encourage you in church. Keep your life from being unpolluted. If there's any programs that you watch, cancel those things that may be polluting your mind. If there's music that you listen to that's polluting your mind, get rid of it. Fill your life with worship. Fill your life with things that honor God. Get close to Christ. Keep yourselves from being unpolluted. Unpolluted. The third thing you need to do, the third and final thing you need to do to prepare for Jesus' second coming is this. Invest in the bank of heaven. What do I need to do to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ? Invest into the bank of heaven. Wait, wait, time out, Marco. So you're telling me that there's a bank in heaven. Absolutely, there is a bank in heaven. Check this out. Five times in the book of James, James emphasizes God's generosity towards us. 
Everything that we have is because God is so generous to you and to me. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from heaven. Then James says that God's generosity should make us you and me generous toward other people looking for opportunity to bless others do you look at opportunity to take your resources and receive them just for you or do you look for ways to invest into the the kingdom of heaven by investing into the only two things that are eternal your relationship with god god and people those are the only two things that are going to last forever so if you want to invest in the bank of heaven invest into the kingdom of god by investing into people. You know, one day a very wealthy man came to Jesus and he asked Jesus for the best advice on how to prepare for eternity. And what Jesus did is Jesus gave him some pretty good investment advice. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, hey, hey champ, why don't you liquidate some of your assets here on earth and, and just go ahead and send them on ahead of you to heaven and let it start earning interest for you there. Jesus said this five different times. Here's one of them. Luke 12, 33, it says this, sell what you have and give to those in need. This will store up treasure for you in heaven. I, I love it. I, I gotta hop on my soapbox for a second here. I love when people come to me and go, you know, Marco, I don't know why you encourage people to tithe to give 10% of their income to, the, to their local church. Um, there's many reasons I talk about it, but number one, you know, people come to me and go, that was law, tithing's law, that's Old Testament, we're in the New Testament. Whoa, time out. Tithing was way before the old, before the law was actually written. Uh, Abraham tithed, and he was before the law. So there was Abraham, then there was the law, and then in Matthew 23, 23, Jesus says that you should tithe. The very thing, word tithe, comes out of Jesus' mouth, that we should tithe. And so my question for you is this, is we also see here in the Bible to sell everything. If we want to go completely New Testament here, the Bible says even in Acts, it says sell everything and give it to the poor. So, hey, do you want to tithe and give 10% or do you want to sell everything and give it to people and help other people out? Uh, Pastor, I think I'm just going, I'm going to stick to the 10%. I'm going to, I'm going to tithe. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. All right. By getting your treasure into heaven, it will be safe for eternity. No thief can steal it and no moth can destroy it. By the way, if you don't like me talking about money, this probably isn't the church for you because Jesus talks about money. And a lot of times our wallet is connected to our heart. And you know what Jesus is concerned about? He's concerned about our heart. And that's what we talk about here at Vibrant Church. We are real, we are authentic, and we talk about real life issues, including yo, money. Let me ask you this. Do you really need everything that you've got? Jesus suggests that you might be able to sell some of it and help those out who have a whole lot less than you do. Again, investing into eternity, investing into the bank of heaven. And Jesus says this, every time that you do this, check this out, there's good news. Every time you do this, every time you invest in the kingdom of God and you invest in people, you're storing up treasures in heaven. See, this tells us that Jesus says, store up treasures in heaven five times. Anytime that Jesus says something five times, we better go, uh, hey Jesus, wait, what'd you say? Can you, can you say that again? We better pay attention to it. Don't be a victim. Don't be a hoarder. Don't be all oh, poor, pitiful me. Take what you have and bless other people. Be rich. Be rich by being generous.